Thank you for taking the time to watch this episode of Life Support. If you enjoy the content, we would ask that you like it, hit subscribe, and share it with your friends. Hey, so glad to have you right here on Life Support. And what we do is tell stories because we want you to find a deeper relationship with Jesus. And sometimes that comes through suffering. Sometimes that comes through trauma. And we talk about that here freely. We want you to know there's healing. And we're talking about a topic today that is close to my heart because I am a pastor. And the book is Caring for Clergy. And our guest is Dr. Thad Austin. And Dr. Austin, it's so great to have you here. As we were talking last time, um, the the idea of um, caring for clergy, it seems like it should be biblically obvious. But apparently, we've got some work to do in that. Tell me again about why you wrote the book and your background leading you to write this book and why it was so much on your heart. Yeah, so so grateful to be here with you. Um, so my uh, background is actually in pastoral ministry. I served in the local church for more than a decade. And uh, after I went back to school and entered into a university setting, I became really passionate uh, in seeing uh, how I could be helpful to some of my colleagues. I'll give you a really quick example. Here in the past uh, two uh, weeks, uh, I had a conversation with a member of my, um, uh, just a close friend and colleague who served in pastoral ministry. And he uh, he reached out because he's undergoing a, a job change. He's uh, left pastoral ministry and uh, is now a um, is 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 working at a nonprofit, um, and I I just asked I said hey I wanted just to check and see you know how things how things going and he said well I just I got I got beat I realized that I was sacrificing my family uh, on the altar of vocational ministry and I got tired of it. And so, you know, and I think about him and and the struggle that 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 he has under undergone. The large scale national studies that we know about what's happening with pastors, you know, they tell us that if you were doing well prior to the pandemic, then you're probably doing okay now. But if you were borderline, you know, struggling prior to the pandemic, you were doing substantially worse off now than you were doing previously. And if you were struggling prior to the pandemic, then, then things are really difficult for you. So this is my gift, uh, this book, Caring for Clergy, Understanding a Disconnected Network of Providers, has really been my, my gift back to the, the church that I love and also the pastors uh, that, that I love to try to help understand how they might be able to be better supported in their ministry. Do you find that congregants generally think about this very often. I mean, when when you are a pastor and you you've been in in pastoral ministry, you're you're baked into this thing. You know, you it's pretty much all you think about aside from your family, right? Because it's just the way it is. Um and then we tend to think that our board and our congregation are thinking about this uh at the same level and they're just frankly they're not. And maybe that's one of the disconnects that you found is just there's a disconnect between how pastors think the congregation's thinking and how they really are thinking and vice versa. Would that be true? Uh, I think it is often the case. And what is so surprising about this, if you think about the history of the care and support that, that clergy uh, and our religious leaders have received, it is deep. It goes back to the founding of <clears throat> the nation of Israel. So think about the book of Leviticus, just as a kind of case in point. There's an entire book in the Hebrew Bible that is specifically devoted to understanding the requirements for the priesthood and also the ways that those priests would be, the priests and Levites would be supported. Um, this is a very, very old tradition that communities of faith come together to support their, their pastors. Um, and so, and so I, I, I think it's, um, you know, we might be at that place of kind of uh, a luxury where where we uh, who are sitting in the pews oftentimes aren't thinking about how we can support our religious leaders. We expect instead for them just to support us. Um, 
I don't think that clergy have had it worse off than other professions during the pandemic. Um, I think about, you know, folks in the healthcare industry, just as an example, or frontline. Know, you know, what's, what's really been rough. Talk to an ER doc over the, you know, past two, two years. But that's not to say that clergy have not been immune from some of the struggle that they've been facing. And oftentimes, the question really that I've been thinking about is, is who is who's caring for the caregiver? And that's the substance of this of this book, caring for clergy, understanding a disconnected network of providers. Yeah, that's a great question. Who is caring for the clergy? That's um, Dr. Thad Austin, and we're talking about this particular issue. Tell me about the Common Table Collaborative and what that's all about. So I, uh, as I mentioned, from my own personal background, uh, am not just interested in this uh, topic of supporting our religious leaders from only a theoretical standpoint. Uh, this is personal for me. I, I care deeply about the church. I care deeply about the movement of God. And I want to see our clergy and congregations flourish. As a result, I wanted to to, to, to do a formal, academically verifiable study that would provide some insight into what would it be like if we created the conditions for our religious leaders to thrive. And that's what the, this book is about, and also understanding what are the barriers that are in place. On the theoretical side, but at the same time, I've been really passionate about actually making a difference. So beyond just simply understanding the problem, I want to do something about the problem. Th these are colleagues and friends of mine who are burning out and, and they need support. They need help. And so what we've done is we've established uh, a, a group that's called the Common Table Collaborative that is designed to help stitch together the uh, divergent, uh, often disconnected entities, individuals, and organizations that provide support for clergy and also congregational well-being. We use this analogy in the book of Moses, Aaron, and Hur. And so we've been asking the basic question, who's supporting the arms of Moses? Who are Aaron and her today? And what we found is that oftentimes that this network is very disconnected. So the mission of the common table is to bring together these providers, these supporters of clergy and congregations to first and foremost build friendships, to create space for collaboration, and then also to highlight leading models so that the support and care our clergy and congregations receive will be improved with time. I think that's great. And I, 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 the guys I and gals, I guess, that I worry about, you know, 90% of the churches in the United States are very small churches. Um, it, you know, churches that have larger attendance, larger budgets— you know they can they can sometimes afford to send their pastors away. They can pay good salaries, um, but some pastors are all by themselves, day after day. They might have a, a part time secretary, and that wouldn't be uncommon in our country. How would they even know that there's help out there? Yeah, that, that that's part of. That's part of the problem, honestly. Yeah. So when we surveyed uh, the supporters of clergy uh, and we asked, you know, you know, what are the barriers that that you've identified? Uh, we often heard what I uh, what I often heard when I was serving a pastor uh, in pastoral ministry, which was, I wish I'd known about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would think, yeah. Well, you know, it, it was in the bulletin. Uh, it was in the newsletter. We put it on the website. We showed a video during the service, and we included it as part of the benediction. But still, there'd be somebody in the church who'd say, man, I wish I'd known about that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So so one of the pieces that we do find that uh, are part of uh, the problem uh, is just simple communication and knowing who's out there. Where is their help available? And that's part of the mission of the Common Table is that in bringing together these different providers, whether they be retreat center host, licensed 
benefit and insurance organizations that serve clergy, denominational officials, and those that fund these different institutions, if we're able to bring them together to be in greater collaboration, it's more than just creating a kind of awareness. Uh, we also want to create synergies where there's increased partnerships that uh, that can take place. And we're already seeing some early fruit of that through the common table. Yeah, I'm glad you're working on that. That's really important. The book is Caring for Clergy. Dr. Thad Austin is our guest. Um, okay, so coming from a pastor, um, there are days when um, you, you honestly walk out of the office and say to yourself, I can't do this anymore. Lord, um, you know, how do I know if you're calling me away from ministry, et cetera, et cetera. But then this thought always comes, yeah, but you're, you know, other people are struggling too. So, you know, you're, you're called, get over it, move on. And I'm not really sure that's a healthy way to look at this. I think sometimes clergy feel guilty for thinking that they need help because they're supposed to be the ones that are called and they're the ones helping other people. So how, how would one get past that initial, well, yeah, but I can, I can do this or I have to do this kind of mindset? Yeah. So the, uh, the question here is such, such a critical. This is my friends and colleagues who are serving in pastoral ministry. One of the greatest dangers that that I see is is some of them who uh, say, as the disciples did to, to Jesus when they were asked, you know, will you depart also? And their response was, to whom else should we go? <laughs> you know, like, yeah. where else? You know, like that. That for me is one of the pieces that that I think so incredibly dangerous when there is a resignation to service within the local church, because it's like, what else am I going to do? I have a master of divinity, or maybe I, I don't have a formal education. What am I qualified to do other than serve in the local church? And when our religious leaders think that there's nothing else that they can or could do, when our religious leaders get um, uh, demotivated to the, to the place at which they, they just simply resign. I mean, we talk about quiet firing uh, in the past few months. Uh, there have been a number of articles that have been written on this where people, um, uh, and even quiet resignation, uh, so they, they resign uh, their passion, their fire for, for why it is they do what they do. That diminishes, but they still stay in the position. You know, that's not a good sign for um, uh, a flourishing congregation or a, a thriving within our, our religious institutions, if people are just simply doing a job. So, so how, the question is, how do you get, get beyond this? And I think there are a few ways that, that I would suggest are important to consider. The first is to identify what is it that's causing those feelings? And also, are those feelings from God or are they not from God? The church has done a very poor job of, of helping some religious leaders understand how they might be actually called out of local church ministry into some other type of vocation. Or maybe they're called for a season, but not necessarily for a lifetime. We don't have a theology, we have a theology of calling only into, but not out of. Uh, a local congregational setting. So the, the first question I would ask is to, to examine your own soul. And is this from God or is this not from God? Because if God is calling you to, to step out in boldness and faith in another direction, then I want you to follow that because that's what God is calling you to do. But instead, if it's because you are exhausted you know, you, you've been working 60, 80, 90 hours a week. You've not been taking Sabbath uh, on your last vacation. So you could drive back home. You know, if if that's the situation where where it's actually coming because of a lack of boundaries, then then maybe there's a there's a different type of problem that's in place. 
either with your own understanding of how that calling is implemented in the local church, or perhaps the boundaries that need to be established within the context of, of your congregation. So, so that's the basic question that I would start with. Is this of God or is this not of God? And if it's not of God, that means there's a problem that needs to be addressed. Yeah, and I think sometimes, at least for me, I can't answer that question until I get counsel from others. And so I've got to find some people and develop some people through my lifetime and through different cities that I've worked in um, who I know who to call. And I they know me well enough to be able to say, yeah, no, we've been through this before. You'll be okay. Do this, do this, do this. Or, yeah, Paul, you know, I think it might be time. And I don't know what I would do without mentors, honestly. And I think that's a vital part of trying to decide or trying to figure out what's going on inside of you. You've got to bounce it off people that know you. And so I would think that that would be a, a huge part of trying to answer that question. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, Joshua had Moses in my example. Uh, Elisha. Sometimes we create this Lone Ranger kind of messianic uh, yeah. complex where we say, well, I've got to do it all on my own. And I don't think that that's an adequate understanding theologically of what it means to be the body of Christ. The body of Christ includes many members. And anytime one member says to the other, I have no need of you, that's that's an issue. So understanding how and in what ways those different members of the body are stitched together are incredibly important. Did you deal at all, uh, Dr. Austin, with a pastor's wife and the family structure and how um, the family is impacted by pastoral ministry? So uh, th there, there have been uh, a number of uh, studies that are emerging that are looking at clergy spouses. Um, and I think uh, most recently of a study that was done by Lifeway Research uh, to better try to help understand even what is the job description? This is a really interesting, they, they took a very interesting approach. It partnered with Rick Deshaun um, uh, uh, from Coetic, uh, who also has an affiliation with uh, University of Michigan to better understand what is the role? What's the job description? What is the expectation? just simply of being uh, a, a, a clergy uh, spouse. And as you might imagine, there the job description, and it, uh, and it is very, very long. Uh, there are unwritten expectations and uh, pressures that are often placed upon not just the clergy person, not just the pastor, but also their spouse as, as well. Um, I'm sure you know, I mean, it, it's no, uh, it's no secret that in, in many, there are a number of cases where the quiet resignation, the quiet firing that, that occurs isn't just with the pastor. Sometimes it is with the spouse or with the children, uh, who then, you know, what does it say about our religious institutions when the children of our religious leaders abandon their faith, or they say, I don't want, if this is the way you treated my dad or my mom, yeah. I don't want anything to do with your organization. Yeah, that's not uncommon. Yeah, that's not an uncommon thing you run into. Um, in the in the couple minutes we have left, most of the people listening right now are congregants. A um, couple things that they can do, uh, even if they don't know their pastor very well, how can they support the, the pastors that are, are or their spiritual leader that's uh, overseeing them. So awareness is is so key. And understanding not just the specific needs of of your pastor, about inviting conversation to say, I love and support you and your ministry. I know that this profession. Um how can I support you? I think that there's there's part of it that's that. But then I also think in a larger uh, context is understanding what else is out there and available for uh, for clergy. That's the reason why we wrote this book, Caring for Clergy, Understanding a Disconnected Network of Providers. I'd encourage you to pick up the book 
and to take a look at the academic work that we've done that's empirically verifiable and says, at scale, here are some of the issues that, that we're raising. To begin to think and to imagine, to create the, the, the synapse that allows you to be, uh, to be thoughtful about how you can better support your religious leader. Uh, because we think that by having, well, let me put it in the, in the opposite, in the negative, you cannot have a healthy congregation without a healthy clergy person. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. The religious leader has to be healthy to have a healthy congregation. Now, whether or not there can be a healthy, con a healthy religious leader in an unhealthy setting, that's, that's another question. But a, a, an important, necessary, and essential prerequisite is that the religious leader has to be in a healthy setting. So if you care about the church, if you care and love your congregation, then I want to invite you to think about how you can better support your pastor. And one of the ways that I would our work caring for clergy, understanding a disconnected network of providers. All right. Tell me how to get the book. Uh, so you can purchase the book uh, wherever books are sold, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Just search for Caring for Clergy, Understanding a Disconnected Network of Providers. Or if you're interested, uh, you can go to caringforclergybook.com. That's caring, F-O-R, book. Uh, sorry, caringforclergybook.com. It's a great time to have written it. We're coming out of COVID, and now we've got huge political divides. And believe me, those divides are in the church, too. And so uh, I'm so glad you wrote the book, Dr. Thad Austin. Thank you for joining us today. It's been uh, really wonderful to talk to you over these issues with you. Thank you so much for the invitation.